I'll be, I'm your moderator. I'm Brian Irons. I'm a professor with the Texas Tech uh, School of Pharmacy at the Health Science Center in Lubbock, Texas. Uh, I'm also the division head of ambulatory care. I'm board certified in uh, ambulatory care pharmacy and board certified in advanced diabetes management. I'm no longer a BCPS. I was for 14 years and uh, let it lapse after I got my Amcare boards uh, a few years back. Um, anything else about me? I went to school in Wisconsin, PGY-1 in St. Paul, Minnesota, and my PGY-2 at Texas Tech, where I've been a faculty member since 1999. So with that, we're going to get right back on track and talk about endocrine and metabolic disorders. Everything you ever wanted to know in 75 minutes. I wish it was everything you want to know. Unfortunately, with 75 minutes, we can only really hit the highlights of the things. I have no conflicts of interest. What we are going to review, however, is the main concepts in the treatment of hypo and hyperthyroidism. We're going to look at uh, Cushing's disease uh, as part of the adrenal insufficiency and adrenal disorders. We're going to look at obesity and a lot of the newer medications out to treat obesity over the last few years and wind things up and spend most of our time on diabetes management, in the particular diabetes mellitus. Things we won't cover that are actually covered in your workbook include pituitary disorder, which we're not actually going to hit, uh, hypoadrenal disorders, which we're not going to talk about, um, PCOS, and diabetes insipidus. But again, there's a lot of uh, the useful information in your uh, workbook on those different topics. So with that, let's start with thyroid disorders. And first, we're going to start out with hyperthyroidism. We're going to focus our time on Graves' disease, which is probably the more common disorder you're going to see in hyperthyroidism. Again, this is where it's an autoimmune disorder where your body naturally or, uh, stimulates T3 and T4 synthesis and release by mimicking through antibodies of your naturally uh, formed TSH. So it kind of mimics TSH and spits out way too much T3 and T4 in the body. There is uh, other information on thyroid storm, uh, pituitary adenomas and the like, in your workbook, um, subacute thyroiditis, drug-induced hyperthyroidism. Amiodarone is one of those drugs that is notorious for causing either hypo or hyperthyroidism. Uh, and in a lot of cases, if the patient is receiving too much therapy um, for hypothyroidism, they can become hyperthyroid. It's also another cause of hyperthyroid disorders. And we're not going to cover uh, subclinical hyperthyroidism today either. Well, if you look at the labs, your TSH level and your free T4 can tell most of the story of uh, what the patient has. Not all of it, but most of it. In Graves' disease, uh, you're going to have a low TSH level and elevated free T4 level. Those elevated T3 and T4 levels in the body help uh, turn on that negative feedback mechanism to the pituitary and shut off TSH production. If you have an adenoma in the pituitary gland, however, and this isn't Graves' disease, it's a different cause of it, you can see abnormally high TSH levels as well as elevated T3 and T4 levels. From diagnostic purposes, they can get antibodies for the thyroid and in some cases uh, radioactive iodine uptake, though it's lost a little favor over the, over the years. When I talk to my pharmacy students and residents and medical students and residents, I always tell them that your thyroid is like your thermostat. When it's revved up, everything is going at increased rate. With respect to the presentation for patients with hyperthyroidism, they often have increased appetite, weight loss, may or may not have a goiter. Uh, they're usually heat intolerant, often have fine hair, have cardiovascular uh, aspects, including tachycardia, in some cases palpitations, and worst case scenarios, MI. Uh, they can be very nervous, anxious, uh, uh, and, and often have insomnia as well as uh, have moist skin, sweating, and that bulging eyes that you remember from your uh, pharmacotherapy sequence when you're a student. Well, the goals for thyroid disorder, uh, in this case, the first three are, are like any disorder, uh, is the, to improve the overall quality of life of the patient, to minimize or eliminate symptoms, to minimize the long-term damage, which there is a lot of with hyperthyroidism, uh, and to normalize the free T4 and the TSH levels in the body. So our first case, and I don't cover every single case I have in my workbook, but we're going to hit the highlights. We have a woman who's just recently diagnosed with Graves' disease. She does not want to undergo ablative therapy, which is usually the treatment of choice, but she wants to try medications instead. She has a low TSH, a high free T4, 
and complains of feeling anxious and warm all the time when everybody else feels cold. So, using our ultra-high-tech audience response system, which is the most appropriate initial option for this patient? Is it iodine therapy, PTU, atenolol, or methimazole? All right. See a little smattering, mostly yellow out there. Good. All right. Again, the treatment of choice for hyperthyroidism and Graves' disease is ablative therapy using radioactive iodine. Um, if it's due to a pituitary adenoma or anything like that, anything with an adenoma, um, you know, I want out of my body. You know, a lymphoma, adenoma, uh, melanoma, anything like that, I want it out of my body. That's all there is to it. So anything with endoma is a bad thing. You want surgical resection for it. So if it's a secondary cause during an adenoma, you want to do surgical removal of that adenoma. But from a Graves' disease standpoint, it's a blade of therapy. We usually reserve pharmacotherapy for patients who are either awaiting ablative therapy or surgery because it helps deplete stored hormones in the, in the thyroid gland, or patients not a surgical or ablative candidate or refuses such, like in our case, or if uh, uh, you've already done ablative therapy and or surgery and it simply wasn't sufficient enough to normalize thyroid levels. Well, the drugs we usually use haven't changed in a very long time. Same things you learned in pharmacy school. PTU and methimazole uh, inhibit the uh, iodination and the synthesis of T3 and T4 in the thyroid gland. Based on the current recommendations out there, methimazole is the preferred agent based on its ADR profile compared to PTU, which we'll talk about in a moment. It usually requires monthly dose titrations, usually guided by your symptoms and your TSH level and free T4 to a certain extent. By itself, it doesn't work really, really well. And it's not certainly going to put most patients into, quote-unquote, remission after one to two years of therapy using PTU or methimazole. It may take uh, several weeks for symptomatic improvement, and we may not see the maximal effect of these agents for up to four to six months in some cases. Neither drug is actually more efficient than the other. They're both effective uh, in the same way. But based on the ADR profile, uh, PTU has been associated with hepatotoxicity, and, and hence why methimazole is considered the drug of choice over over.